In this video, we'll explore a slightly different topic than usual on this channel, and that is looking at how to improve the aesthetics of our PCB designs. Usually we are primarily focused on getting the actual design right with respect to function, signal integrity, EMI, and so on, and quite rightly so. However, aesthetics can play an important role in a design, as we'll see in this video. So looking at some of my current PCB designs, and then we'll look at some previous PCB designs of mine, we can see that the aesthetics, not just the complexity, has improved vastly. Although aesthetics should never take priority over function, reliability, cost, time to market, and so forth, and to be honest, most people will never see the PCB in a finalized product, improving your PCB's aesthetics can have benefits when it comes to manufacturability, usability, and more. So often it does pay off to spend a little more time on cleaning up your PCB, so to speak. We'll explore more of this in this video, where I'll give you some main pointers on what to look out for and how to improve the aesthetics. Lastly, and quite honestly, I do actually personally enjoy these final steps or during the PCB design of trying to make it really clean and therefore make it more visually appealing. Let's get started. Briefly looking at some of my older PCB designs and then comparing it to my more modern PCB designs, we can quickly see, of course, not just the complexity is much lower in my initial PCB designs, but also the general aesthetics. And there's much I would improve on in these designs if I were to do them over and over again. We'll go into far more detail in the video, and this is just to show you how designs can improve and what it means for a PCB to be more aesthetic than another one. This was actually one of the first PCBs I did, and if you're interested in looking at how my PCB designs have changed, make sure to check out video number 43 on my channel. For example, one of my second or third PCBs shown here definitely has improved visually, but still not as clean as it maybe could be. Compare that now to these PCBs, which happen to be manufactured and assembled by PCBWay, which I'll show you in just a second. These are far cleaner, more organized, and easier to use designs, and I'll show you why and some tips later on. They're cleaner in terms of how the silkscreen is placed, the silkscreen on holes, for example, the connector placement along the edges, grouped sections, grid placements, and so on. Again, we'll cover this in more detail. Or for example, this FPGA-based hardware accelerator on a very limited small size, so about 20 by 80 millimeters, even though of course this appears huge on screen. The function and complexity is there. However, I also always try to put an effort to make it visually appealing for marketing reasons, to be able to showcase this in my portfolio for usability, user-friendliness, and so forth. The most recent PCBs you have just seen were all manufactured and assembled by PCBWay in China, who are also sponsoring this video, so thank you very much to them. I used their advanced PCB service for the PCBs you just saw, where you can pretty much configure everything you want, anything up to 60 layers or more HDI designs and pretty cool stuff. If you'd like to try out PCBWay for yourself, they are offering a custom Phil's Lab coupon for you to use, which gives you $10 off an order that is $40 or more. To get your coupon, simply sign up and go to the specials and my coupons tab on the left side, type in PCBWay Phil's Lab, and I'll put this coupon in the description, then click apply to balance and we have this $10 voucher. Although these tips of course apply to any ECAD software, my preferred tool of choice is Altium Designer, and Altium is very kindly sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab, and you can check out all of the cool new Altium 365 features, such as cloud storage, design review capabilities, and far more. This is the PCB in Altium Designer you just saw before, the matte black with yellow silk screen, which is a digital signal processing board, dual-sided assembly. And I think this is a good example to show how you can fairly easily achieve pretty nice aesthetics just by following some simple rules, and I'll also tell you why this is actually useful to do. Again, good aesthetics make your design cleaner, easier to root, because as we'll see, we're adhering to certain grids. They'll be visually appealing, so you can showcase them, you can show them off to potential employers, show them these are your projects, and that this is usually quite a distinctive factor between beginner PCB designs and more advanced PCB designs, is simply by looking at it, you can see the quality of work. There are, of course, also functional benefits, and we'll cover that in more detail. For example, if we have silkscreen overlapping copper, if the manufacturer just goes, goes ahead and produces that, this reduces the manufacturability, and more importantly, it reduces the solderability. We want proper labeling, for example, using this board. So, for example, this is the serial wire debug header. We have the in port labeled, out port labeled, and maybe even pin labels and more. So, not only does this look nice, but it also serves a function, for example. Again, this is fairly broad, let's go into more detail now. One of the main gripes I have usually with design reviews is proper grid settings are not used. 
We have many different grids in our ECAD tools. If I open up my grid settings, I can go down to 0 0.025 millimeters, which is tiny, up to something huge like two and a half millimeters. When I do my initial and finer component placement, if I can, I typically never go less than 0.25 millimeters. This means all of my components I've placed, for example, all these resistor banks, if you look at the right XY coordinates, they're nicely on this grid. Placing items or components on the grid means I always have the same separation between resistors, for example, and also then my traces because they have to enter at very similar angles and spacings. And this greatly improves aesthetics, but also placing it on a larger grid means it's easier to move around, navigate, and easier to inspect, for example, pick and place files and so on. When it comes to choosing a grid, of course you don't want to place your components too close to each other. This is that the pick and place head has space to move and place the components. And I generally think closely spaced components, if course avoidable, are far more aesthetic as well. Of course, not a huge spacing that should be placed in neat groups, but not too tight and not too far away. Again, many of these aesthetics tips have functional benefits as well, but I highly suggest sticking to a certain grid. For example, if I change my grid to 0.025 millimeters and just move this off slightly like so, okay, this is maybe functionally a perfectly valid design, but suddenly we have this eyesore here and there's no reason to do that. It makes our life easier just sticking to a certain grid and changing it only if we really have to. A great way to improve the aesthetics of the board, and this is something you should be doing anyway, is doing proper partitioning and proper sectioning of your PCB. That means high speed on a certain area, analog on a different area, power on a different area, and so forth. Not only is this a great help when routing laying out, but your functionality, signal integrity, EMI can always pretty much benefit from proper partitioning of your board. Same goes with the aesthetics, and this is particularly true for connector placement. Connector placement should typically always be on the perimeter of the board, ideally just on one side, but in this case I've done it on all four, and partitioned. So for example, all of my control inputs are at the bottom, I have my power in one corner, I have my digital on a different corner, and my analog on a different corner as well. We can also see that on the bottom side of the PCB, my digital, bottom half of the PCB, my analog is all top right. As I said before, not only is this functionally very important, but I believe this also makes it look far more aesthetically pleasing, at least to me. Let's talk about traces, and why I strongly feel that traces can also improve your aesthetics. For example, let's look at this section coming out of the microcontroller here. We have many parallel traces, these happen to be ADC traces, and I've routed them in a particular way. So they're all spaced equally, they have roughly similar length, similar routing angles, and so forth. What I oftentimes see a lot in especially beginner PCB designs is traces which are routed with minimum clearances that the manufacturer can support, for example, like so. Not only do I find this incredibly unesthetic, it also is bad functionality wise. A closer spacing means more coupling between the lines and thus more crosstalk. By spacing them out as I did, not only does this look prettier, so to speak, but I also have a functional benefit that it's easier to manufacture, I get less crosstalk and so forth. It also enables me to place test points between these lines without having to route out and around. On the topic of traces, I also take care of how I enter and exit pads. For example, one of these QSPI lines, I could simply route in, for example, like so. This means I have this small triangular shape and acid traps used to be a thing and this would have been considered a, a cause for an acid trap in older PCB manufacturing. Nowadays, it isn't that much of a problem anymore, but I typically like to avoid it. Also aesthetically, if you compare that, I don't think that looks particularly pleasing. Therefore, I find it's a good idea to always route, if you can and space allows, into the center of the pads like so. Another option, of course, would be to route out like this, for example, but then again, you're giving yourself less clearance between the pins, and I generally don't recommend routing underneath or between pins of components. So my preferred routing method, again, also improving aesthetics, is something like so. Again, something very, very simple to adhere to, but it greatly improves not just the aesthetics, but also the functionality, manufacturability, and so on. Another way you could improve this is by using teardrops. In Alton Designer, I can click on what segments I want to apply teardrops to, go to Tools, Teardrops, and just click OK. And you can see we've added this small fillet here, which is my teardrop. Again, to improve aesthetics, it can also improve functionality for higher speed designs to ease the transition from this thin trace into this wider pad. Although, to be honest, it doesn't actually matter that much. But that's a topic for a different video.
When it comes to the board outline, oftentimes you may be unconstrained if this is a hobby project, if it's something just doing your spare time. But for aesthetics, if you have an enclosure, I feel it's important to design specifically for that enclosure. Not make it too small, not make it too big, of course, that it doesn't fit, but make it fit the enclosure suitably. This is not just the board outline, it's also the component placement. So if I have certain audio jacks, or in this case, some sort of foot switches and LEDs, they are placed symmetrically from, for example, the center or some suitable reference point of your board. So the spacing of this LED 200 on the left and the spacing of the LED 201 with respect to the origin is the same. Same goes with the audio jacks, same goes with the foot switches. The easiest way to improve your designs is to make them symmetrical about the origin, for example. And oftentimes this is far more useful when it comes to assembly, manufacturing, and so on. So make sure your board fits your enclosure, make sure you talk to your mechanical team if you're working with one, and make sure your component placement is well thought through. This also, again, with respect to grids, means placing your connectors not on 10.125, but rather on 10, for example. So make sure they're nice round numbers if you're using metric or imperial. You will have probably noticed on this PCB that I have this sort of edge plating or rather exposed copper along the outside of this board. Not only is this very aesthetically pleasing if you choose the right surface treatment, and I'm talking about Enig predominantly, so immersion nickel gold, but also it serves a couple of functions. First of all, this outer perimeter is grounded. So if I'm doing testing and I have these various test points sprinkled around this board, I can use this, for example, as a ground for my oscilloscope probe and so forth, or then tie this to the housing at appropriate points and methods, for example. However, there's a, also a more important reason, and that is in a multi-layer board, if you have, for example, power planes, one way to reduce edge-fired emissions because your power plane extends to the end of the board and can have these fringing fields on the outer edges is to place these guard traces, so to speak, around the perimeter of the board. So the stitching is done appropriately depending on the wavelength of the maximum frequency of interest in your signal. So this is a great way of also shielding and preventing or reducing edge-fired emissions. So again, aesthetically, this is great, but it also serves a proper function as well. The next topic is that of the board outline and board edges in particular. We look at this different PCB, also a digital signal processing PCB. We can see I have no sharp edges or sharp corners on the outline of my PCB. This is because the outline of the PCB is typically milled and we're going to be using a round drill bit, so to speak, and we can't really make square or perfectly square corners. The manufacturer will typically adjust this for you if you have square corners and they'll round that off slightly. I like to take that work away from them and thus have a more predictable outcome of my PCB design when it's manufactured. Oftentimes I'll see square cornered PCBs and while the manufacturer will change that, I'd rather, as I say, make their lives easier and have a predictable design. So I always like to add rounded corners and I generally think this is more aesthetic as well. A big tip to improve the visuals of your PCB designs is to think about silkscreen placement, sizes and so on. First of all, just the pin one indications, so little dots usually, or polarity indications of your diodes. Typically I will mark my cathode with a line. These are of course predominantly important for, for optical inspection, manual assembly and so on. And this is the bare minimum I would add in terms of silkscreen. Silkscreen generally, and especially these pin one or anode cathode indicators should not be on copper and should definitely not be on via holes regardless if they're tented or not. These are very important in a design. In general, silkscreen should not overlap copper. Depending on your manufacturer, your manufacturer might check for this, spot this and remove the silk screen from the layers before then actually manufacturing your boards. But if they don't and they just go ahead and make your design and just imagine you have silk screen on top of copper, it's going to be very hard to solder that. So it'll reduce the yield or the performance of your PCBs. So keep silk screen far enough away from copper and not on top of holes is my suggestion. Again, this will also improve the aesthetics because it doesn't really print properly. To showcase, here's a via hole on top of silk screen. Although these vias are tented, this doesn't look particularly great. Furthermore, you can of course just use the standard font which comes with your PCB design package and that's perfectly fine, but if you want to improve the aesthetics, I'd recommend changing maybe the font and maybe using this inverted silkscreen printing. If I click on one of these, I've used a true type font. I prefer Century Gothic, but this is completely up to you of course, but I use this inverted setting in Altium. If we compare the difference, I think it highlights the connector or the area I want to bring out far greater. So that's why I typically use for connectors or labels and so on, I, I use this inverted setting with a true type. Make sure you choose the right font because some fonts, for example, serif fonts, which are more like handwritey fonts, it can be very hard to print, especially with small features, for example, dotted eyes and so on. So I typically like to go with sans serif fonts and choose my fonts fairly carefully. 
Also make sure your text height is not below 1 or 1.5 millimeters as that will be very hard to read. So text height 1.5, 2 millimeters is a minimum. Also text thickness will change as well and make sure you stay away from any minimums that it's legible as well. Looking at the final product, we can see, you know, this is, this is fairly clear that as a minimum, I wouldn't go any smaller than that. What I almost always add to my boards is, of course, my own logo, the Phil's Lab logo. And wherever it's suitable, I will add, for example, my initials, PS, a revision number of this board. This might have had 16 revisions, and I'd like to indicate that on the PCB. And when the board was finalized, for example, this one in August of 2022. Some of the things, for example, the maximum voltage, of course, you can indicate as well. For production versions, I also like to put a serial number and maybe a little checkbox to make sure I can, I can just check this with a marker, say I've tested this for functionality and this is fine to move on, for example, to shipping, packaging, whatever you want. Again, these are small things, but I feel like they're pretty cool and improve the aesthetics of your design, but also can help, for example, in an assembly line or if you are making these products in quantity. Finally, a great way to control the looks of your PCBs, and one of the easiest ways is choosing suitable surface treatments, that is hot air surface leveling, which is usually pretty cheap, or immersion nickel gold or any other surface treatments you might need for your design. Of course, this will change the function as well. It'll change the cost. So these should be prioritized rather than appearance, particularly, for example, if I'm doing this edge plating, so to speak, this isn't proper edge plating, but I'm doing the perimeter. I like to choose immersion nickel gold, and generally you get a better product lifespan, flatter pad finishes with immersion nickel gold. Another option is, of course, to choose a different solder mask. So in this case, I've done blue, matte black is pretty cool, and different silkscreen colors as well. Just to compare, here's matte black. And of course, most of the components are soldered on, but we do have some immersion nickel gold plating on, for example, these pads over here. So this is a pretty cool look, but it also has benefits for assembly, soldering, and so on. You have to be careful though when choosing your solder mask color because that could change the constraints with your PCB designs. It could change the minimum solder mask slivers you're allowed and more. Comparing that to a matte green, although this looks cool, I definitely prefer the matte black. But again, it's a personal choice and it might depend on the product we're making. And at the end of the day, it's a cost adder with no particular benefit, pretty much as aesthetics. Briefly looking at PCB way, of course, we have all of these options available here as well. So what I was talking about is the solder mask standard is a normal green. And if I just look at the cost of a 10 by 10 centimeter PCB, just two layers, just with a normal green solder mask, that's just $5. However, if I go to a rather specific solder mask, for example, matte black, this increases the cost quite a bit. Of course, oftentimes it can be worth it, but it's not something that you necessarily have to do. Same with the silk screen, you can change that as well. And the surface finish, which we can choose here, for example, Enig, will be more expensive as well. Things to just to be aware of, but it can also help, especially with the surface finish. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was insightful and gave you some tips on how to make your PCB designs a bit more aesthetic. Keep in mind though that function, SI, EMC compliance and so on should always take priority above aesthetics. However, improving aesthetics oftentimes has benefits to also the function of your product. So make sure to keep that in mind. Thank you for watching and I hope you do subscribe to the channel if you like the video. Please do like the video and leave a comment if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.